A small country that suffered through many invasions, Romans, Vikings, Nazis, and so on, the Netherlands became a major European power in the 1600s with colonial possessions that spanned the globe, only to see a steady decline in the 18th century and an eventual return to prosperity in the 20th. To see why, join me in this brief look at the history and politics of the Netherlands. The earliest record we have of inhabitants in what is now the Netherlands are of the Neanderthals from some 40,000 years ago. In the following millennia, plenty of distinct cultures left evidence of their presence in the future country, including, for example, the Vorstengraf, the largest burial mound in Western Europe that dates from early in the Iron Age. In more recent times, the region became a crossroads that would see multiple invaders throughout its history. Some of the earliest were the Germanic tribes from Scandinavia in what is now the north of the country, and the Celts in the south at the dawn of the first millennium AD. Then came the Romans, who under Julius Caesar conquered a wide region along the Rhine and its tributaries by 59 BCE. Utrecht then became a main outpost of the Roman Empire, but not without the occasional rebellion. The most famous was the Batavian Revolt in 6970 AD, led by Gaius Julius Civilis, a hereditary prince that was an auxiliary officer in the Imperial Roman Army. It had at its roots the disproportionate use of their men as troops for the Romans. The Batavians had some early successes, destroying two whole legions, but massive reinforcements soon arrived and crushed the rebellion, forcing the locals to accept humiliating conditions for peace. The Roman period lasted around 450 years, leaving a huge cultural and social imprint, not to mention roads and fortifications which are still being unearthed today. As Rome's power began to fade, the Franks, a German tribe to the east that had converted to Christianity, began to muscle in, including into northern territories beyond the traditional borders of the Roman Empire. They began by establishing a bishopric at Utrecht, an important center for the Catholic Church for the following six centuries, and systematically moved to displace the local inhabitants, the Frisians and Saxons, two other Germanic tribes. The final conquest of the former seems to have come at the Battle of the Born in 734 AD, which pushed Frankish territory to the east of the Lawers River, while the conquest of the latter took place when Charlemagne defeated Widokind, king of the Saxons, in 789 AD and took possession of the western side of the river. The winners then began converting the local populace to Christianity, using force whenever necessary. Charlemagne was by far the most successful Frankish king, unifying not just the Netherlands, but most of Western Europe, including half of future Italy and the northern part of Spain, into what later came to be known as the Holy Roman Empire. He built a palace at Nijmegen, near the German border, but the empire was severely weakened after his death in 814 AD and continued to exist more in theory than in practice in the Dutch lands. For the next 200 years, the Netherlands faced a different kind of invading menace, the Norsemen or Vikings, a seafaring people from Scandinavia who began looting and pillaging towns on the coast and along rivers. Although the invaders did not settle in Dutch land for the most part, they constructed a few long-term bases which became strongholds with recognized Viking rulers, such as Rorik of Dorestad. In response to the Norsemen attacks, local rulers began fortifying their towns. Over time, these lords, who were nominally bound to a German king of the Holy Roman Empire, began to gain power, making their own laws and jockeying with neighboring rulers for territory. When one lord struggled with another for land, invariably their townsfolk would provide support, but only in return for various freedoms, which were set down in charters. These newly independent territories included the county of Holland, an important power center that developed in the 10th century around what is now Harlem, slowly expanding until it eventually annexed Zealand and West Friesland. Its rise, however, would be interrupted by internal disputes over who should rule it between 1350 and 1490 a conflict known collectively as the Hook and Cod Wars. Meanwhile, the territory further north joined the Hanseatic League, a loose confederation of merchant guilds that united for commercial and defensive benefit, bringing prosperity to the area. These included several towns with sea axes, such as Deventer, Elberg, Groningen, and Zwolle. By the 13th century, this dynamic changed with the arrival of an important new player, the Prince of Burgundy, Philip the Good. Member of a French noble family, the House of Valois, Philip inherited the Duchy of Brabant, gained the Countship of Holland, and imposed as a legitimate son of David of Burgundy as the Bishop of Utrecht, unifying most of modern-day Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg into what historians later called the Burgundian States. This was an important period not just for creating some of the first proto-national institutions in the region, like the Parliament of Mechelen, and the creation of a modern bureaucracy of clerks, but because it became an important cultural center based on ducal patronage. 
The Burgundian era ushered in great prosperity for the Low Countries. The Dutch became adept at shipbuilding in support of the Hanseatic trade, and merchants thrived by selling luxury items such as tapestries, fashionable clothing, and paintings, as well as more mundane commodities such as salted herring, beer, and especially in Amsterdam, grain. The Netherlands could well have ended as part of a larger future Burgundian state, but instead it transitioned to the domain of the Spanish Habsburgs. That was because one of the Burgundian princes, Charles the Bold, died young and unexpectedly at the Battle of Nancy in 1477 as a result of a conflict with the old Swiss Confederacy. His heir, Mary of Burgundy, then married Maximilian I, the Holy Roman Emperor, who in turn had a son, Philip the Handsome, who became the Spanish king through his marriage to Joanna of Castile. The new rulers of the Netherlands would soon face opposition in the Low Countries. To some extent this was inevitable. The Protestant Reformation spread quickly throughout the Dutch lands in the early 16th century, fueled by the ideas of Erasmus, one of the great scholars of the Northern Renaissance, and the actions of Martin Luther, the German monk that started the Reformation itself. Before the Spanish arrived, the religious landscape of the Low Countries was quite diverse. There were Catholics, Lutherans, and Anabaptists, but in the end it was Calvinism that emerged in the Netherlands as the main challenger to the Roman Catholic Church, and especially to Spanish rule under Philip II, grandson of Philip the Handsome and a staunch Catholic. A big believer in the Inquisition, Philip II went after the Protestants with a vengeance. Matters came to a head in 1566 when the puritanical Calvinists went on a rampage, destroying art and religious icons of Catholic churches in an event the Dutch called Bildenstorm. This infuriated Philip, who sent a 10,000 strong army in 1567 to quell the unruly serfs under the command of Fernando Álvarez de Toledo, the Duke of Alba. The Duke set out to prosecute those responsible for the 1566 riots with the creation of a council, what the Dutch call the Court of Blood, and quickly began executing people. By the time he was done, at least a thousand were killed and thousands more were found guilty and had to flee for their lives. The cost of the troops to maintain this operation going was expensive, so the Duke attempted to finance it with new taxes on the population, but instead sparked a massive rebellion that soon spread across the country. The Dutch War of Independence had begun. Known as the Eighty Years' War, it resulted in the deaths of at least 100,000 people and much misery. The Prince of Orange, Willem the Silent, was one of the few nobles not to side with Philip and would soon become the leader of the revolt. In 1572, Willem hired a bunch of English pirates to fight for his cause. Known as the Watergeisen, sea beggars, they sailed up the myriad Dutch rivers seizing towns from the surprised and land-bound Spanish forces. By 1579, the more Protestant and rebellious provinces in the north formed the Union of Utrecht, what would eventually become known as the United Provinces, the basis for the Netherlands as we know it today. The Spanish would yet have several offensives and continue to win terrain, but the stiff resistance of the Dutch, broader European conflicts, and the lack of money would eventually lead to a stalemate that was only resolved with the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, an agreement that forced Spain to recognize the independence of the United Provinces. Throughout the turmoil of the 15th and 16th centuries, merchant cities, particularly Amsterdam, had managed to keep trade alive, so once peace arrived, they began to boom. It helped that the Dutch, for all intents and purposes, invented modern capitalism with the invention of the bond market and stock exchange. This innovation in contracts allowed them to finance not just the war against Spain, but the prosperity of a golden age. This amazing era produced not just artistic masterpieces from the likes of Rembrandt and Vermeer, but also a number of important works in the social and natural sciences, not to mention literature and architecture. These include the work of Spinoza, a seminal thinker of the Enlightenment, the place of Jus van den Vondel, arguably the most important Dutch literary figure of the time, the detection of Saturn's rings, the invention of the pendulum clock, and the first description of bacteria by Antony van Leeuwenhoek, which set the foundations for microbiology. Just as importantly, liberal tolerance attracted scientists and thinkers from all over Europe, such as the philosopher Descartes and John Amos Comenius, the man considered to be the father of modern education, making the Netherlands a center of learning. A few setbacks notwithstanding, like the first acid bubble in history, the Tullipmania of 1637, the Dutch success also fueled an empire. First, as a geopolitical consideration for their own independence, they began fighting and absorbing a number of Portuguese domains, which themselves had become part of the Spanish crown after the Iberian Union in 1580. Second, once this proved to be a very profitable project, commercial interest became the main motivation. In 1602, for example, they created a merchant fleet known as the Dutch East India Company, 
a venture that quickly monopolized key shipping and trade routes east of Africa's Cape of Good Hope and west of South Africa's Strait of Magellan, making it the largest trading company of the 17th century. It became almost as powerful as a sovereign state with the ability to raise its own armed forces and establish colonies. A parallel enterprise for the other side of the world, the Dutch West India Company, was created in 1621. That project was placed at the center of the Atlantic trade involving sugar, rum, and of course kidnapped Africans, and established several colonies in the Americas, including that of New Netherlands, which would later become New York. Not surprisingly, international conflict was never far away. In the next 50 years, there would be three distinct wars with England and an assortment of alliances with Spain, France, and Sweden in an effort to gain the upper hand. Conflict with the English began to erode their power. They lost both New Netherland and Guyana and their naval superiority. Even worse, in 1672, the year the Dutch called Romp Yar, or Disaster Year, the French army invaded and nearly overran the country's weak defenses as a result of the Dutch devoting most of their resources to the navy. People blamed Johan de Witt, the leader of the Republic, for the catastrophe, and lynched him along with his brother on August 20th, 1672. William of Orange, de Witt's opponent, then took leadership of the country and rallied to a stalemate that eventually led to a peace treaty. The sense of calm was quite temporary, however. For the next century, there would be additional wars with France, Spain, and England as part of larger European conflicts in 1688, 1718, and 1780, respectively. The wars proved the undoing of the Dutch in the 18th century. Conflict was costly, and the ties that bound the United Provinces together started to unravel, beginning a spiral downwards. The population shrank due to falling fortunes, and political instability became the norm. A series of struggles between the House of Orange and its opponents that favored a democratic republic, a group that came to be known as Patriots, led to a civil war which would go on for decades. In the first period, known as Patriotentide, the Patriots started to gain control after 1785 and were well on their way to deposing William of Orange, but their movement was stopped by a Prussian invasion in 1787 who reinstated Orange's power. This did not last long. In 1795, revolutionary France invaded and established the Batavian Republic, a French client state that placed power in the hands of the Dutch democratic patriots. Things turned again when Napoleon decided to turn the Republic into a monarchy with his brother Louis Bonaparte as the sovereign of a new kingdom of Holland in 1806. Napoleon's failed Russian invasion, however, appended French authority in the country and the Dutch took the opportunity to establish a new monarch. The man picked for the job was Prince Willem VI, another heir of the House of Orange. He was crowned king in 1813, beginning a monarchy that continues to this day. After Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, the Congress of Vienna, intending to create a buffer state north of France, created the Kingdom of the Netherlands in 1815, which included Belgium. The marriage was doomed from the start, however. The partners had little in common, including their dominant religions, Calvinist and Catholic, languages, Dutch and French, and favored way of making money, trade and manufacturing. Matters weren't helped by Willem, who generally sided with his fellow northerners. In 1830, the southern states revolted, and nine years later, Willem was forced to let the south go. In return for recognition of Belgium, Willem secured the return of the eastern part of Limburg, ending Maastricht's nine years as a West Berlin-style isolated Dutch exclave. In 1848, the broader political turmoil in Europe convinced his son, King Willem II, to grant a new and more liberal constitution to the people of the Netherlands. This included a number of democratic ideals and made the Netherlands a constitutional monarchy, which it remains. Its role on the world stage long over, the Netherlands played only a small part in European affairs and concentrated on liberalism at home. It stayed out of World War I but profited by trading with both sides. In the 1920s, growing affluence of the middle class fueled a desire for more liberalism. The Netherlands embarked on innovative social programs that targeted poverty, the rights of women and children, and education. Rotterdam became one of Europe's most important ports, and the massive scheme to reclaim the Zuiderzee, the shallow bay in the center of the country, was launched in 1932. The Dutch tried to remain neutral during World War II, but in May 1940, the Germans invaded. The advancing Nazis leveled much of central Rotterdam in a raid designed to force the country to surrender. They had little choice but to oblige, and the Queen to flee to the UK. The monarch, who had been key in maintaining Dutch neutrality in World War I, now found herself in a much different situation and made encouraging broadcasts to her subjects back home via the BBC and Radio Orange. The Germans put Dutch industry and farms to work for war purposes and there was much deprivation. Active resistance to the Nazis was minor at first, but kept growing 
as the war continued, especially when thousands of Dutch were taken to Germany and forced to work in Nazi factories. Far worse fate awaited the country's Jews, the vast majority of whom were shipped to concentration camps. This included the most famous Dutch Holocaust victim of all, Anne Frank, a girl who along with her family was shipped to Auschwitz on September 3, 1944. Those who remained suffered through what the Dutch call Hunger Winter. The British-led Operation Market Garden had been a huge disaster and the Allies abandoned all efforts to liberate the Dutch. The Germans stripped the country of much of its food and resources and blockaded food and fuel shipments from farm towns. Mass starvation ensued, leading to the deaths of at least 18,000 people. The ordeal finally ended when Canadian troops liberated the country in May 1945. That month, Queen Wilhelmina returned from exile to establish a new government with stronger democratic pillars. And in 1949, the Dutch recognized the independence of Indonesia, the last remaining part of their empire in Asia. During the 1950s, a path to prosperity began to re-emerge. In 1951, they joined the European coal and steel community, the basis of what would later become the European Union. There was also a corporatist consensus where the government, industry, and labor agreed on a plan that would avoid the rapid expansion of prices and wages to keep down inflation. The arrangement worked for two decades. Not bad. Meanwhile, after disastrous flooding in Zealand in the south in 1953, a four decades long public works campaign began to literally reshape the terrain and keep the sea forever at bay. The reclaimed land eventually led to several artificial islands which formed the basis for a new Dutch province, Flevoland. The 1960s brought new social upheavals with baby boomers rebelling against the rigidities of Dutch life. Students, labor groups, hippies and more took to the streets to protest women's rights, disarmament and environmental issues. Among the more colorful were a group that came to be known as the Provost, which specialized in trying to bait a violent response from authorities using nonviolence but also came up with some practical policies. Among these were the White Bicycle Plan, the first shared bicycle plan in the world. Tolerance towards drug use and gay rights also emerged at this time. The country's drug policy grew out of practical considerations when Amsterdam's flower power era made the policing of drug laws impractical. Official government policy became supportive of same-sex relationships and in 2001, the Netherlands became the first country in the world to introduce marriage equality. Economically, the Netherlands prospered more with each passing decade, allowing a largely drama-free middle classes by the late 1980s. All governments since 1945 have been free coalitions, with parties mainly differing over economic policies. However, coalitions shift constantly based on the political climate, and in recent years there have been winds of change. One of the major sources of political tension during this period has been over immigration, especially that of Muslims. This began with Pinfort Tyne, a former Marxist professor at Erasmus University who became a prominent media commentator that railed against multiculturalism, contributions to the European Union, immigration, and Islam in the Netherlands. His creeds found some political support, but what really made the mainstream was when he was shot dead days before the May 2002 election by an animal rights activist in Hilversum, some 20 kilometers from Amsterdam. His shocking murder led his political party to gain enough seats to join the governing coalition but without four times leadership, it faded away by 2007. This did not dispel the tensions over immigration, however. If anything, they got worse after another shocking assassination, this time of Theo Van Gogh, a filmmaker and provocateur who made a short film claiming that Quranic verses could be interpreted as justifying violence against women. The film was a collaboration with Ayan Hirsi Ali, a Muslim-born woman who had emigrated from Somalia to escape an arranged marriage and eventually became a member of parliament. The film aired on Dutch TV in August 2004, and three months later Van Gogh was killed as he was cycling down an Amsterdam street. The killer, a 27-year-old man of Moroccan descent, born and raised in Amsterdam, left a letter threatening Kirsi Ali in particular. He was soon caught and sentenced to life in prison. Since then, the person that has carried the anti-immigration banner has been Geert Wilders, leader of the Party of Freedom, or PVV, a far-right outfit that has been an important force in Dutch politics since 2010, becoming at different points the third and second largest party in the country. That year, the PVV supported Mark Rutte, the leader of a different conservative party, the VVD, as prime minister, a position he has held since then. At first, and in part because of Wilder's influence, Ruta's government made a number of proposals that were a sharp break from previous centrist Dutch policies. But since then, Ruta's government has had leftist parties in its coalition and has moved back to the center. 
Despite multiple scandals and the worst riots in the country's history in 2021, which resulted in response to a proposed nationwide curfew because of COVID, Ruta has become the longest Dutch prime minister in history. How well he and the country can deal with the aftermath of the pandemic and the challenges of the 21st century is still an open question.